Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, mighty God. Father, come and have your way tonight. Come and pour your flesh upon your children. You have never chosen to come to this prayer meeting because we are righteous. No. You have always come because, Lord, you show mercy to your children. You choose to come, Lord, because it is in your nature to love your children who are weak. Even as we gather in your name, you come down to be with your children. And so, Father, even today, as we have gathered in your name, we say thank you for bringing us to this place of prayer, place of fellowship with you. We are mindful of our sins and our iniquities. We are very mindful of our worthiness. And so we come to you, O oh God, and we ask for mercy. Have mercy on us, King of glory, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Father, blot out our transgressions. Every sin we have committed, knowingly or unknowingly, we ask for mercy even at this hour, Lord. We want to encounter the power of the precious blood. That blood that washes away the sins of your children. Father, touch us tonight. Let not our sins hold accusing fingers against us. Mighty God, blot out our transgressions. Take not away from us the gift of your Holy Spirit, but restore unto us the joy of thy salvation. Father, we need the Holy Spirit tonight. That great teacher, that great one that inspires us to understand your word, to understand the scripture, uh, Father, we have come to hear from him. Holy Spirit, take over tonight. Come down, come down, and dwell among your children. Reveal the scripture to us. Help us to understand from your own altar, from where you teach the church, Jesus. That hour has come. Holy Spirit, we hand over the instrument for this message to you. Use him as a microphone to speak to your children tonight. In the name of Jesus. We cover ourselves with the blood of Jesus. We cover the message with the blood of Jesus. We cover the messenger with the blood of Jesus. The atmosphere where we are for this prayer. We cover with the blood of Jesus. We cover our hearts with the blood of Jesus so that our hearts would not only hear the word of God but keep the word of God Father take over tonight we need you we we'll give you glory we we'll give you worship who give you all adoration, O oh Lord. Blessed be your name. In the name of Jesus. Amen and amen.
and amen. But our friends, he cried, Jesus, what a great privilege we have to be in the presence of the Lord tonight. To hear from his very word again. For the word of God gives life. It gives hope to the hopeless. And I pray that the message of today may bring strength to your soul. To every one of us. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We shall be taking our reading from Genesis chapter 16, verse 7 to 16. Genesis chapter number 16, verse 7 to 16. And I'm going to be reading from the New Revised Standard Version, Catholic Edition. Then the Lord, the angel of the Lord, found her by a spring of water in the wilderness. The spring on the way to shore. And he said, Hagar. Slave girl of Sarai, where have you come from? Where are you going? She said, I am running away from my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Now you have conceived and shall bear a son, you shall call him Ishmael. For the Lord has given him heed to your affliction. He shall be a wild ass of a man with his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him and he shall live at odds with all his kin. So she named the Lord who spoke to her, You are El Roy. For she said, Have I really seen God? And they remained alive after seeing him. Hagar bore Abraham a son, and Abraham named his son, whom Hagar bore Ishmael. And Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. And this is the word of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Jesus. And thanks be to your holy name. In Jesus' name. My dear friends, I welcome every one of us to the hearts of Jesus and Mary Ministries. Today, I come to share with us a message titled, The God Who Sees. The God who sees. We have different ways that we look at our God. And most of the time, we identify our God by our experience of Him. For example, 
Abraham called him the God who provides. Because he, God, provided a ram for Abraham on the mountain. The mountain where he was to sacrifice his son Isaac, God provided a ram. So he called him the God who provides. If God has given you protection, then you call him, he is my protector. If you read Psalm 27, we see the testament of David testifying with his very mouth that God is his light and his salvation. He is a protector because he had experienced salvation from God. David tells us in, in Psalm 27 verse 1 also that the Lord is a stronghold of his life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Because he has experienced God's protection. So he was not afraid of the wicked. David was not inclining on his strength or his skills to fight. No, he, he knew how to fight, but he trusted in God. And so he says in Psalm 27 verse 2, When the wicked advance against me, to devour me. It is my enemies and my foes that I stumble. Why? Because the Lord has always been with him and has been with him. I don't know the experience of what you have had with God as to give him a name. But today, the Lord is taking us to someone who is not even a Christian. Someone who is not even an Israelite. Someone who did not have the privilege to know the God of the Jews. Who didn't experience this God from her, from her culture. Because she happened to be an Egyptian slave girl who was a slave girl of Sarah. And her name was Hagar. Coming from an ungodly culture into a family that is godly was going to reveal to her the character of God that she would have upon experiencing that character of God would give God a name. Now, all things, we are all going well for Hagar in the family of Sarah. So one day, Sarah recommended or suggested to Abraham, you know, since God has not been able to give us the child that he promised, you know, I permit you to go and, uh, and, and sleep with a slave girl. Uh, for Sarah to do that tells you that, uh, that this slave girl had found some favor before her. Everything was going well between two of them. But it wasn't too long, even when she took in, that things began to go sour. Sarah noticed that Hagar was no more very submissive to her. And so she got angry. Sarah got angry. Say, look, you have forgotten that I'm your mistress. I used to tell you to fetch water. You go and fetch water. I used to tell you to sweep the house. I, I don't. I don't even need to remind you things to do. You do them now. Not that I remind you things to do that you are supposed to do without being reminded. But now you are no more listening to me. You no more obey my instructions. And so, Sarah made sure she was driven out of the house. 
And so in the reading of today, we see a wandering girl, young girl, young uh, woman wandering in the desert, in the wilderness, wandering hopelessly. That was not a good picture of life. She could not see future. It was horrible for her. But it was in this situation that she encountered the God that would have come to this prayer meeting to worship. And after encountering that God, she gave God a name. It says, the God who sees me. <laughs> the God who sees me. Because she was going through a season of hopelessness. God met her in the midst of her hopelessness. And it's so interesting that God told her to go back to her mistress and be submissive to her. That's what Angel told her. In Genesis chapter 16, verse 9. Return to your mistress and submit to her. If in spite of all her problems, all the situations she was going through, God will tell her, go back to the house and be submissive. He tells you us that <laughs> many of us today are going through storm that only submissiveness would quench that storm. But that's not the focus of this message. The focus of this message is the very title, the very um word or description that Hagar gave to God, saying, the God who sees me. And so I have the pleasure tonight to share with us a message titled, The God Who Sees. Not the God who sees them, not the God who sees her, or who sees him, the God who sees me. Like Haga, you may be um, an immigrant, just like Haga was an immigrant. She was a native of Egypt, an Egyptian slave girl. But God visited her. God visited her. And I have a message tonight for someone who is here in this mess in listening to this message tonight that God in his mercy is going to visit you tonight. He will visit me tonight. We also know that Hagar listened to the angel and went back to be submissive to her mistress Sarah but then along the way even when she gave birth to her child and named the child Ishmael uh, things became sour again when Sarah saw one day uh, where Ishmael was afflicting Isaac because brother Isaac had been born <laughs> and she told herself, look, if I leave this woman and her child, I'm going to have a problem. Look, Hagar wasn't the one beating Isaac, the son of Sarah. It was Ishmael that was beating 
molesting, afflicting Isaac. And so again, Sarah now recommended, again, pressured Abraham, her husband. Look, this time, <laughs> you have to divorce this woman. You have to send her away from this house. Send her away with her child. Do you hear that? Sarah had known that if Ishmael were sent away and the mother is in the house, one day Ishmael will grow up and come back to look for the mother. And so even what appeared to be a, a, a solution was just a temporal, a temporal peace. And the problem will come in a bigger way. Because by the time Ishmael will be a big, a big boy and coming back to the house, he was coming able to fight. And of course, <laughs> Sarah Barata must have been much older, uh, weaker to be able to stand against him as much as he had much strength that she could not contend with. And not even Abraham would have been able to match his strength. And that reminds me, you know, many times we solve a problem but not from the root. We, there are times we have to cut off completely. Our children of God, they shouldn't be compromised. If Sarah had kept Hagar in the house and decided to get rid of Ishmael, that would have been compromised. And time would have proved her wrong. And if she had decided to send away the mother and leave the, the son the, or the child, one day the child would grow up and say, where is my mother? And that would be another problem in the house. So many family problems of this nature. Where is my mother? Or where is my father? <laughs> and even now, when they were now sent away, this time around, it was a very painful divorce. And the first time, Hagar was a pregnant and expectant mother. In the second time, she was a single mother. The pains this time are great. And the first time, the only thing she needed was taken of herself. And she just managed with life. But now she had a small boy with her, a baby. A single mother. And she was abandoned by the family that she belonged to. And look at her in the wilderness with her son alone facing a cloud of hopelessness. Never seen future. With very little provisions. And what, it, what were those provisions? Actually, only one skin bag of water for how long will that water go and of course the water ran, ran, ran short and the boy was crying in the wilderness needing water needing food and this woman being hopeless for there was no water and there was no food left him there to die not to die in in her arms but dropped her somewhere in the wilderness and left far away so as not to hear this the cry of, of the child. She didn't want the child to die right in her front. Let it happen behind me. She wanted to solve the problem that came to her by pretending 
to be to, to to have ignored the problem as if the problem is no more there leaving the child and then going far away she would she wasn't hearing the sound of the boy again she wasn't hearing the voice of the cry of the boy again but the boy was crying the boy was crying but she wasn't hearing the boy again she had gone far i don't want to stay and watch my son die she swept the problem under the rugs many of us do same do the same thing we come across issues in life we don't know what to do we look around we struggle but no way no promise no no way to move forward to come out of it it was as if there will be no solution out out there and many a time we make irrational decisions let the problem take care of itself instead of putting the problems in the hand of god we pretend as if the problem is not existing meanwhile the problem is there Ishmael was crying. The trees were hearing his voice. The animals there were hearing his voice. And God was hearing his voice. He's a cry, but not the mother. She wanted to solve the problem in the best way known to her. Her mistake was that she did not pray. But who would blame her? Her culture was not a culture that knew how to pray to the living God. Remember she was an Egyptian lady. So she left the boy to die. She had so many questions without answers. So many things, wondering, uh, she was wondering so many things in her heart without any clue of what to do. Her baby was crying, she was crying. Her baby was broken, she was broken. She was in despair. In fact, she was lost in, in her despair. Does that sound familiar, my friend? Are you going in situations that appear as if you are crying in the desert and God is far away, God is not even hearing you, there's no sign that rain will fall. <laughs> Woo! Even for Hagar, it was the same experience. She was crying, the boy was crying. Meanwhile, the sun was hitting harder and harder. There was no mercy on her. Neither on her child. No mercy. <laughs> and she assumed the worst. That the child would die. But she was wrong. She was wrong because it was the midst of her pains. In the midst of this hopelessness. That God came. When she thinks that nobody loves her, that nobody cares for her, that was when God came and broke the silence in the wilderness. That was when someone came and that was the one to solve her problems and that was God. And when God came, God changed the ugliness. <laughs> God took away the clouds. Took away the veil. Took away the pains. Took away the hopelessness. God returned her beauty. 
she thought that nobody loved her, God brought love to her. And there, God made water to spring forth in the wilderness. Put yourself in these shoes, in the shoes of this hopeless woman. And then ask yourself, would I not be grateful that God meets me in this hopelessness, saving my life and saving the life of my child? Of course, we have to be grateful. And so Hagar was grateful and gave God a name. The God who sees me. The God who sees my, mystery, my misery. The God who sees my pains, my despair. The God who sees me when all have rejected me. When it appears as if there is no hope. The God who sees me. That was the name she gave God. Have you given God name? Is there something that God has done for you that when you remember it, that will be your anchor. You say, <coughs> the God who did this in the past, when it was so bad and, and the, it was as if there was no way I could come out of it alive, and, and today I'm, I'm living to testify it, that God will see me through this one. Hagar thinks nobody was there, but she was wrong. Someone was there, capital S, and that was her God, the one that made her. <laughs> How many times have we, like Hagar, thought that God had abandoned us? Anyway, he cares, but not for me. He loves well, but not me. I mean, if he cares, why would I be go why would I be going through all these? That is the mistake of Hagar. For Hagar was looking at the situation she was going through, never looking at the bigness of her God. When we focus on the problem, the problem will present a picture of hopelessness. But when it's part of the situation we focus on God, I tell you, it's a matter of time. You will see that you have made the best decision. For those who focus on God, they don't think. Remember Peter, when he was walking on water? You, you remember that he was walking on water and was looking at Jesus? Was he thinking? No. When Peter began to think, was when he began to look at the storm, the problem, the wind. <laughs> that was when he began to think. If you continue to look at the problems they are going through, you lose sight of the fact that you have a God who sees you. And that is what the devil wants. They want to distract us, shift our attention from focusing on God to either focusing on ourselves or focusing on, 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 on human being or focusing on the problem. If he succeeds in shifting us away from God, I tell you, he has, he has succeeded. Except if God's grace intervenes, like that of Hagar. Hagar never prayed! <laughs> she never prayed. She never said, God, have mercy on me. That never came out from her mouth. Okay? But see, see, even though she did not pray, yet grace came to her. Grace, unmerited favor. You see, that God came, it was not by her merit, no. God just came. That's why it's grace. Unmerited favor. <laughs> Woo! 
Jesus. It seems to me tonight that grace is coming someone's way who is listening to this message. Someone that thinks that God seems to be far away. That God appears to be far away. But God is bringing His grace your way. Something might seem to be hopeless. That does not mean that 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 situation is hopeless. Really. Most marriages that have gone through the worst storm in life, many of them have ended up to be an exemplar in marriage. If you had focused, if they had focused on the storm, they would have missed the beauty. How many children of God have missed the beauty, the prize, the crown, because they focus on the struggle, on the pains? Hagar was focusing on the situation. She was focusing on the cry of the son. She was focusing on the injustice done to her in the family of Abraham. And she was focusing on, 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 on the provisions that she had. She had no provisions. The water had gone. The water used to be her provision, but the water, water was gone. And many of us would depend on our provisions. On the bank account, what we have in the bank account will, will depend on maybe on our strength, on our beauty, on, on our education. Uh, and so many things we depend upon, on our eloquence, maybe some skills we have. We have. Many times we depend on these things. And sometimes, I tell you, and this is one of, one of the things I've come to know about God. God wants all those provisions to become little and then disappear completely. So that... When he now comes, when he now blesses you, when he now restores you, when he visits you, when he solves the problem, then you give him glory. And that was the case of Hagar, my friend. Hagar was not crying when she had a little water in the, in the skin bag. Because, well, water, mm, that's, a, that's a provision. Something was still with her, though. But how long would that water in the bag go? No, there was no reckoning on any account of food with them. Anyway, the, the, the baby may be drinking some, some milk from, from her. But for how long would that go? And so now, the little provisions were gone. And she was... <laughs> what was facing her was the wall. Wall of hopelessness. Wall of hopelessness. And God came and pulled down the wall of hopelessness. Permit me to announce tonight that the wall of Jericho must fall. That wall of hopelessness in our lives must fall down today in the name of Jesus. That is a great power in the name of Jesus. We must not depend on our provisions. We must depend on Christ. That if we must depend on any provision, that provision must be Christ himself. Remember when he sent his disciples? <laughs> they left with very little provisions. Very little. Telling them anywhere you go, and they, they open the door for you. There you sleep, there they will feed you. He was teaching them how to live one day at a time. When we begin to live in the future, that is when the issues begin to, to rise. We begin to, begin to worry about the future. We watch television, we see that um, the stock market is, is falling. And, and our, somebody's blood pressure will be rising when the, when the stock market is falling. You see? 
Uh-huh. The many corporations are folding. People are losing their jobs. Uh, you listen to this news in the in the media, uh, and it's it's causing the heart to break. Fear. Somebody will begin to live in fear. Okay. During this pandemic, a, a boy who got a job, he would have started that job, uh, but because of the pandemic, uh, so the company told him, you know, that uh, he should wait until the pandemic is over, and uh, he waited for some weeks, uh, then about a month and uh, some weeks, he couldn't bear it. He felt that, well, uh, who knows when this COVID will even stop, when it's going to come to an end, and he was not seeing any hope. They didn't even tell him that, he was going, that they were not going to take him. He just told him, just hold on, let this thing be over. Then, you know, you start, you start job with us. But all he could see was hopelessness. And he went and committed suicide and killed himself. He could not see any, any hope. Nothing pleases God than when we rest on his own provisions, resting on his arms, allow him to carry us, not our strength carrying us, not our wisdom or skill carrying us. How many times have we passed the exam and we tell ourselves, well, well uh, I work so hard, you know. Oh, Mr. Johnson, oh, you made an A, 99%? Oh, you know. All these years it's been so struggle, you know, I've been reading and reading and um, I hardly pass, uh, I hardly sleep. You are giving yourself the glory. You see that? But when you are totally incapacitated and there was no reason to pass the exam, you're not even prepared and you have 99%, Hey, then you cannot but say it is God. Because only him that could do such a thing. I shared with you some time ago of a, a, a student who yeah, he came to exam, he didn't know what to write, and he didn't want to cheat. He just submitted a blank sheet. I told that story some time ago. And the professor um, marked everything, and uh, Wazor came out, he made an A. In an exam, he didn't do. He didn't do. He just wrote his name, his registration number, and, and he decided, I'm not going to cheat. You know, he just submitted it and said, God, I don't know what else to do, you know. I, I don't want to, I don't want to cheat. So how he made A became a message to him. He <laughs> was expecting an F, but he had an A. So out of curiosity, he went to the professor. He said, uh, Professor, please, uh, I, I made an A in your class, um, but uh, I, if you don't mind, can, can I see the, the, the way, you know, my, my grading and all that, all that? And the prof said, okay, no problem, brought the script, and found out that this guy submitted empty sheets. Empty sheets. And professor was confused. He said, ah, oh, well, now I remember. When I was marking y- your script, I came and I saw that it, it was completely empty. And I said, it is impossible for a student to submit empty, em- empty sheets. I mean, for the whole semester, you couldn't even write anything. So I put a double question mark. Double question mark, you know, question mark, and that question mark, double of it. You know, that was what this professor put on, on, the, on, the, answer, on the answer booklet. Hoping that he would come across another booklet the student wrote in the bundle and uh, would not discard that, that particular one. But now, when he finished marking, he forgot that um, uh, he put that question mark to, to hoping to visit the matter again. When he was putting the grace, he put it at 77. Question mark, double, 77. Seven, because, you know, question mark, lower at 7. Anyway, Holy Spirit wanted him to see at 7. At 77, seven, at 77. Seven. And this is in a country where 70 is, a, is an A. 
And he had an A. Now he had reported himself. <laughs> he had reported himself. But unfortunately, it was already late because the professor had already submitted the result to the, uh, to the, to the university senate and it had gone through approval. <laughs> Say so you told my friend, I mean you're lucky you're lucky you're a lucky person, Rory. No, you're just lucky. I don't I can't I don't wanna go through start uh, changing your grade. I mean So what I'm talking about trying to say, you see, this is student this example I gave now, you see, this student knew that it was not by his strength that he made an A. It was God provisions. And God wants us to come to the point where our strength, our resources uh, would fail us so that beyond that point we know it is a miracle. We know it is a miracle. And it pleases God to recognize, for us to recognize that that it is Him that is doing this and for Him to take the glory, it pleases Him. Don't forget the case of Peter who f whose feast all night, he did not even catch a single fish. In the morning, where he was full of hopelessness. There he met Jesus. Who now told him to cast the the what the, 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 the net uh, into the deep. And he did in obedience. And we know how God did a great miracle for him. We know how God restored such a great quantity of fish to him. You see that? That is God for you. Peter came to the end of his strength. And God met him at that end. Hagar worked so hard, did everything, but came to the end of her provisions, the end of her strength. And God met her at that end of her strength. So was Lazarus. Whose sickness became so bad that he eventually died. Of course, that was the end of his strength. And of course, he was actually decaying. But God came on the fourth day. And maybe you are going through your own fourth day of a decay. Your own fourth day of crisis. Or maybe you have gone through so much wilderness and so many ugly stories to tell. And you have no provisions. Or maybe little provisions. And I tell you, it is a sign that God is near. Because he's waiting for you to come to the point where he will do it and take glory. Do you hear what I'm talking about? <laughs> oh, Jesus. You think nobody's there for you. You think nobody cares for you. But I tell you tonight, Jesus cares. That was the thought of Hagar. But she was wrong. If that is your thought, you are wrong. We are wrong when we think that God doesn't care. By the way, always remember, and do not forget this, that even Hagar was not a Jewish woman. She wasn't from the, from the, from the nation of the people of God. Okay? But look at how God visited her. If God will visit someone who didn't even know him? Okay? Who didn't know him? And it was not her fault because she came from a pagan world, a pagan culture. And if God will still come and reveal himself to him, I tell you something, God would, would visit you and you will see him. And we give him a name, the God who sees me. Maybe you are going through a fire right now. That's the God who sees you. That's the God who sees me. He will bring you out of the fire. Okay? He will be your glory in the midst of that trouble. He will give you reason to have a testimony. The, the presence of God is powerful. The presence of God. Situation may be so bad, but when the presence of God comes down, hey, instantly, 
the veil will be lifted. The embargo will be lifted. The wall of Jericho will, be, will collapse once the presence of God comes down. You see that? <laughs> David, and I like the way David puts it, you know. David will say, God, would your presence go with me or not? And God will say, my presence will go with you. Go. And David will go and he will conquer. That was how he fought 66 wars. And he won all of them. Because God was with him. The presence of God was with him. This is why we need prayer. Because prayer brings down the presence of God. Whether it is traditional prayer or praise. <laughs> the praise of God is powerful. And that was what changed the ugly situation of Hagar. Her bitterness, her anxiety, her shame was taken away when the presence of God came down. <laughs> may I use the opportunity to tell you something that many of us do not know? The secret of Moses was because he was always going to the presence of God. I wasn't on earth that time. But the scripture tells me that was the life of Moses. Okay? In Exodus chapter 3 verse 15, when God told Moses, go, Moses told him, God, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. In other words, if your presence will not go with us, I will not go. And God tells him, Exodus 3 verse 14, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. People who understand how things work in the spirit, they cannot make a move without God's presence. And when they make a move, maybe by mistake, without God's presence, they don't feel connected. They feel that something is missing. Okay? All, all this time, Mary and, Je Mary and Joseph had been uh, traveling to several places with Jesus. They went to bed to him when Mary was pregnant and then eventually get put to bed there in bed to him. There was no problem. And when Herod planned to kill Jesus um, with Joseph, she traveled to, to Egypt with Jesus. And there was no problem. It's part of the challenges of new culture. Living among the Egyptians. Different culture, different language, everything is different. And yet there was no problem. And when it was time to come back from Egypt, back to the land, there was no problem. When it was time to dedicate Jesus to the temple, she, she, she also carried Jesus with Joseph, and they also traveled to the temple in Jerusalem, and they, there was no problem. But look at it. Look at it. And they traveled, and on their coming back, and they found that Jesus was not with them. They lost their peace. They found that the presence of God had not been with them in that journey. And they began to look for him. And for three days, they searched for him. Praise God that they found him. And so the Bible tells us in Jeremiah 29 verse 13, Thou shalt seek me with all your heart, and you will find me. 
Nothing should replace the presence of God. It is the difference between the, the crisis we are going through and the, our escape. The, dis, the, 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 the distance, the difference between, between the, the testimony and the situation is just the presence of God. Is somebody getting tonight? Presence of God. Not presence of man. When we go and keep company of men, we miss it. <laughs> we know the story of Neman, right? The, the Syrian soldier. A general. But he had a skin disease. He was leprous. But then a slave girl, his slave girl suggested to him and said, or to the wife uh, uh, who cited him and uh, seeing that the, his, his skin had this disease, and recommended that look, there's a prophet in Israel who has the anointing to settle this problem. And uh, this general, Neman, traveled to Israel and met the prophet of God. And the prophet of God said to the servant to go and tell uh, the, 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 the general uh, to go and dip himself in the river. <laughs> and the uh, And the general wondered, why go to dip myself in this dirty water? Are there no better waters in, in Syria? So much cleaner water in, in Syria. Okay? I don't even need to go to the water. I would just tell my servant to go and fetch me water. They go and fetch water for me from the stream or from the well. Clean water. Why would I go and dip myself in this river? But anyway, at the end, we know how he changed his mind. And he dipping himself in the river seven times and he got healed. That was how Nema repented. With his mouth he said, Now I know there is a God in Israel. Now but let me tell you, all this time, he had been familiar with the clean water in Syria. In the city where he lived. He had been familiar with clean water. But there was no presence of God there. I mean, God is everywhere. Don't get me wrong. God is everywhere. Even everywhere God is there. God is He's omnipresent. Meaning he's everywhere. But look. The, the manifesting power of God is not everywhere. There are places he has marked for his miracles, for his power to be revealed. And so the presence of God came down and the water became a healing water. We know the case of water beside that, the same story. And uh, in this very ministry, we are privileged, not because we pray too much, not because we fast too much, no. Yet, we have this privilege in this ministry to enjoy the presence of God in this ministry. That's the only thing we can boast of in this ministry. We may not boast of crowd. We may not boast of, um, of uh, big buildings or... Uh, or uh, cathedrals, or mega structures. We may not boast of these things. We may not boast of money. But one thing we can confidently boast of is that God is here with us. The praise of God is here with us. That's why people are always testifying every time this ministry. Because of the manifesting power, manifesting presence of God. When you carry the presence of God with you, 
the enemy cannot define your journey. Look at the people of Israel. When they were going to war, they will carry the Ark of Covenant. You know why? Because the presence of God is in the Ark of Covenant. The praise of God. So when the presence of God visits you, you cannot miss the road. You solve the problem for you. Look at the people of Israel when they were traveling to the promised land. On the way, in the night, the praise of God will come like a pillar of fire, guiding them, enlightening their way. In the day, the presence of God will come like a, a, a pillar of a cloud. And Moses had been familiar with this manifesting praise of God. He has what we call the tent of uh, meeting, tent of meeting, which is where he will go and uh, lie down on the floor and fellowship with God. And by the time he's coming out, people of Israel will be running away, thinking, oh, this is not the Moses that we know. His, his face is shining. Everybody, every part of his body is shining. Even when he mat went to Mount Sinai, remember? By the time he came from the mountain, his face was dazzling like the, the, the sun. And they ran away. The people of Israel ran away. And they sent Aaron to go and whatever thing Moses wants to tell us, let him tell you, then you can come and tell us. Because we can't, we can't stand him. Glory was upon him. Why? The praise of God. This message of this night cannot come to completion until we begin to realize the importance of dwelling in the presence of God. Prayer. Fellowship. Very important. Taking the Bible and be reading. Meditating on the Word of God. That's how you bring down the praise of God. And it pleases God to do that. To see you Celebrate him. Come to his presence. Is God talking to somebody tonight? <laughs> oh my goodness. We cannot go far without the presence of God. We cannot make it without the presence of God. We need his presence. Look at the prayer, cry of the psalmist in Psalm 56 verse 8. You, you keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. This was a man who understands that God is with him to take care of his situation. And so Proverbs 15 verse 3 says, The Lord is watching everywhere. Hell! Proverbs 15 verse 3. The Lord is doing what? Watching everywhere. Keeping his eyes on both the good and the evil. God's eyes everywhere. If God will keep his eyes both on the good and the evil, why would you think that his eyes will not be on you? Come on, child of God, what's going on? Hagar is talking to us tonight. Even though she, she didn't know the God who was serving today, yet that God visited her in her misery. That God visited her situation. That God took away her pains. That God brought her from the fire. That God brought down His glory in the midst of the trouble she was going through. God, God lifted her up from the dungeon. And she calls that God, the God who sees me. And Jesus says tonight, I am the God who sees you. Do you believe him? Do you believe him that he is going to solve that problem? Do you believe him that he is going to fight that battle for you? Do you believe him that if you cooperate with faith, that all things are possible? Do you believe him? God is speaking to somebody tonight with the gentle whispers. Look, look at, look at the way when God, God's presence came to Hagar, and and the Bible says that, and He called her by her name. Oh my goodness! 
Oh my goodness. The God who did, she did not even pray to. Call her by her name. If you think this is my own scripture, check your Genesis chapter 16, verse 8, I suppose. And the Bible says, And he said to her, Haga, slave girl of Sarah. Aha. Uh-huh. Where have you come from? And where are you going? Child of God, where are you coming from? And where are you going? Are you coming from trouble into bigger trouble? From pains to shame? From pillar to post? But God says, Haga, calling her by her name, to tell you that he knows her very well. There is a power in name. There will be one million people who once once somebody says, Uwakwe, it's me. Somebody calls your name, that means the person knows you. God knows you. And he calls you by your name. He knows you. He knows each and every one of us. He has a plan for every one of us. And he tells us, in Isaiah 43, verse 1, Do not fear. I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by your name. You are mine. Verse 2 says, Even when you pass through the waters, you shall not be drowned. Even when you pass through the fire, you shall not be scorched. You shall not be burnt. Child of God, come on, what's going on? Is God not talking to you tonight? Let the story of Hagar Preach to us tonight. Look at God saying, Hagar, slave girl of Sarah. That means, not only that God knows her name, which is very important, and which means a lot, God also knows her, 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 all, all about her, that, that she, she was the, the slave girl of, uh, of Sarah. God was calling names, not slave girl of some. God didn't say, uh, Haga, uh, you are the slave girl of, uh, of, of that woman, of someone. No, no, God called the name of the woman, Sarah. God had the curriculum of Haga. Everything about Haga was known to him. And that God is here tonight, talking to you, talking to me, whispering, enfolding us with his arms. He's holding us strong so that we don't get drowned or we don't sink. When His presence comes down, we cannot remain the same again. We may change. Our situations may change and become, and become worse. But I tell you something tonight. God never changes. Alright? His promises never change. His promises never change. And His promises are true. The world may change. Of course, the world will change. Okay? Friends may disappoint you. Of course, they will disappoint you. <laughs> and the world may des- desert you. Oh, sure, the world will desert you. But not Jesus. Not Jesus, my friend. Not Jesus. And so tonight, we hand over this message to God and we ask Him to have His way. We thank Him for being the God who sees us. We thank Him for seeing us through the situations we go through. We thank Him for the message of this night. We thank Him for pouring His flesh upon us. As Lamentation chapter 2 verse 13 says, Your wound is as deep as the sea, yet the Lord says, I am your healer. Father, we thank you for the message of this night. We give you all glory, we give you all worship, and we give you all adoration belongs to your holy name. Thank you for touching us tonight with your word. May this word remain in us and help us to bear fruit in your word. Thank you, O God, who sees me. We appreciate you, Lord. Thank you for touching us in our situations. 
Thank you for using this message to strengthen your children, to remind us that even in the season of affliction, just like Hagar and Ishmael, that you're always there with us to see us through, to bring down your presence. Thank you for your presence in this ministry. Thank you for your presence upon us as we get ready to go and sleep. Thank you for your presence that goes with us and comes, uh, even as we go in and come back, your presence has always been with us. So, Father, here we say, thank you. We give you glory. We give you worship. And so we cover this message, brother of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. And amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, King of Glory. My dear friends, I just want to quickly remind us the reading for tomorrow shall be Genesis chapter 16. Genesis chapter 16. Amen. And the prayer tomorrow shall be, we are going to pray for marriages. We we'll pray for marriages. Um, those who are going through turbulent marriages. You see, Haga, in today's message, went through turbulent marriage. But God came and this saw her through. Strengthen her. So we are praying tomorrow for God to strengthen marriages. There is there's so much attack against marriage, against the family values. So tomorrow we are praying for families. We are praying for families, for for marriages rather. You know, we are praying for them. Uh, we are praying for children that are that have been abandoned. So many places in the world, look at the way Hagar abandoned Ishmael to die. So we are praying for children tomorrow. Children that are abandoned. Children that are, that are destiny have been decided this night whether to abort them or not. Children that their destiny have been, will be decided tomorrow whether they are going to be aborted or not. We are going to pray for them tomorrow. That they shall live and not die in the hands of the abortionists in the name of Jesus. So we are praying against the forces that have risen against the family system. May God intervene in the name of Jesus. And you see in this story you also see that Hagar was a, a single mother. In the in Genesis 12, 16 we also see her as as a, a pregnant or expected mother. So tomorrow, we also pray for expected, expected mothers and for uh, single mothers. We pray for them, for the Lord to strengthen them. And we pray, may God bless all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll cover this prayer, brother of Jesus. We'll cover the message, brother of Jesus. We'll cover our brother, whom the Lord have used tonight to minister to us with the most precious blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um.